Good morning, friends. Today we will continue with the lecture. We were doing, uh, we were going through geography quickly. I want to clarify few things. The topics that we are doing, that we are discussing, the these topics are uh, scrutinized only on the basis of the importance in the examination. They might not be in order. They might not be uh, in a proper way, but these topics are important. So I am presuming that. Anyone who is watching this video is already familiar with these concepts, and this is just for revision purposes. Okay, so let's continue. So the first topic that we are going to discuss today, it is Karevas. Okay, there's a term called Karevas. You might have heard it before. Karevas are the deposits of glacial clay. Okay, glacial clay. What is glacial? Glacial is something related to glaciers. And what are glaciers? Glaciers are large formations of frozen water that feeds the rivers. Okay, that feed the rivers. Who feed rivers? Glaciers. Glaciers feed rivers with water, and rivers are the drains which transport that water to the oceans or the seas. Okay. So glacial clay. It is a type of Clay means sand, soil. It is a type of soil that is located in glaciers. So it is a mix of ice and soil. It is a geographical formation, specifically known as crevas. It is used for cultivation of what? Saffron. Saffron is what we call kesar in Hindi. All right. There is a variety called zafran. Zafran variety of kesar or saffron is cultivated in the glacial clay known as karevas located in Jammu and Kashmir region of India. Okay, so in Jammu and Kashmir region, it is log very logical. See, if we talk about glaciers, glaciers are limited to only few states in India, and uh, possibly here because the mountains or in Himalayas or Tehran or Jammu and Kashmir. So it is easy to remember that karevas are where K for karevas, K for Kashmir. Okay, so saffron or zafran, the variety is cultivated in JNK. You need to remember it. All right. So <clears throat> after this, we will talk about two very important lakes. Okay, UPSC has been very obsessed with lakes. You know why? There is something known as wetlands. Okay, wetlands are the places where water and land is like. Uh, it creates a marshy, we can say marshy wet land that is known as wetland. Marshy land means it is a place where there is a lot of water mixed with sand that we call like daldal in Hindi. And why is it so important? Because these marshy lands or wetlands contain a very like they contain a very unique type of uh, we what we say biodiversity. You know what the biodiversity is? Biodiversity is the different dif the inhabitation of the habitation of different different type of species on a place like in a desert there's cactus the plant or there's the desert rat alvira rat or there are many different types of other species uh, belonging to either fauna or flora okay so these all make up biodiversity of any ecosystem so similarly we are talking about what wetlands in context of wetlands, lakes or the areas, regions uh, near to lakes, they are important wetlands. So they have they have a type of biodiversity that is not found anywhere else. So it makes them very important ecologically, okay, or for the conservation purposes. What is conservation? The act of protecting environment from anthropogenic activities. What is the anthropogenic activities? Human activities like pollution, like the outlet of factory water, all that stuff. All right. So we need to protect our ecological treasures that are wetlands, that are related to lakes. So that make makes the lakes very important.
say line length. Okay. Suppose you take a container, you take a bowl of water, or you take water in a container. Okay. And you place a container of water on gas stove, and you just uh, you just turn it on, and there is no outlet of water, so water is contained in the container, and you let it evaporate, or you let it boil. After boiling, the water will boil, the water will uh, go away in form of gas, and what will be left in the container? All the salt contents that were there in the water that were not able to escape. Okay, so similarly, you put more water and let it boil more, more, more. You doing it after after boil, what you will find a small layer of salt on the surface of your pan in which you are putting the water. Okay, similarly, there is a lake. There is no outlet uh, for water to go away from that lake. So what will uh, in due course of time, what is going to happen is there will be a layer of salt that is mixed in water that will make the water very saline. Okay, this saline water will make the lake a saline lake. And suppose there is an outlet of water. Suppose the lake has drains that are uh, able to uh, gather water out of the lake to nearby rivers, nearby seas, and all. Okay, in that case, it will be called the fresh water lake. What do we call it? Fresh water lake. For example, this is Dal Lake. Dal Lake in Shida, in JNK. Okay. Dal Lake is a fresh water lake. Whereas Pogongso and Somori, they have no outlets, so they are saline lakes. Have you understood the difference between the two? So the, these two types of lakes are located everywhere on earth. Okay. So I'll tell you a bit about Pogongso. I know you all must have watched three years movie. In the last scene of that movie, when all the friends meet again after a long time, when there is a scene where it is revealed that Rancho was actually a great scientist, in that scene there is a lake in the background. That lake is none other than Pogongso. Okay. It has very scenic beauty. What is scenic beauty? Like very beautiful landscape. Okay, that is where the movie was shot there. Okay. Now let's continue. We have talked about the lake. Okay. Now we talk about Buller Lake. It is situated very nearby in somewhere in JNK only, Buller Lake. What is so special? It is a very large lake. It is one of the largest lakes of Asia, but it is specialty, it is a freshwater lake. It is one of the largest freshwater lakes in the continent of Asia. Alright, so you need to remember this fact. Okay, so we have discussed salinity of lakes, different lakes, why lakes are important. Okay. Is Buller Lake the largest lake? One of the largest. This is a difference. Because in when we talk about water bodies, their size is not constant. The size of a water body, especially something like a lake, keeps on changing according to the amount of water it has at any specific period of time. So we prefer saying one of the longest. Because just like the builders list, with changing amount of money, the builders list keeps on changing. Sometimes Elon Musk is on top, sometimes Jeff Bezos is on top, sometimes Mukesh Ambani is on second position or third. Similarly, the lakes, depending on the amount of water, depending on climatic conditions of that area. So, we prefer calling one of the longest, one of the largest lakes, okay. Buller Lake. It is a fresh water lake. So, it has outlet that uh, is enabling the water to get replenished over a period of time and not letting the salts to get accumulated, okay. <coughs> So we will continue with lakes. No, so we will move to rivers. Okay, I will tell you an interesting fact about the river known as Jhelum. I will also tell you how our study, how the scientific studies we undertake to study history, archaeological surveys, or to study geography, whatever we do, take samples from different regions, all that stuff. How can we relate all of this to the mythology of our country? So there are always two aspects of things, like there are two faces of a coin. Similarly, there are some stories that try to explain what is going on and at the same time the scientific theories as well to explain those same stuff. So 
when scientists or archaeologists or whoever was researching discovered the characteristic property of jhelum that is to make meanders okay meanders what what are meanders meanders are nothing but it is a property of river specifically a mature river when it weakens and its strength and agility is lost and it starts uh, it, it is not able to make its way through and it starts making zigzag pattern okay a river is going it has a pattern very old it has lost its vigor it has lost its energy so this river is do what like this the shape that this river is making at a mature stage why mature stage because by this time the river has lost all its energy at the mature stage the type of pattern that we go makes is known as meanders okay so while we talk about jhelum jhelum is the one of the only rivers i have not heard about any other river that does the same but jhelum at least in india is the only river that makes meanders at early stage instead of at mature stage i'll tell you the reason we can say young stage it makes meanders in j and k only very near to its home very very near to uh, i think it rises in very next spring we can check it so very near to its home it make what meanders okay so why jhelum make meanders at this early stage so what the archaeologist or the geographical researchers have discovered is it flows through the surface flows on surface of an erstwhile uh, an erstwhile what lake okay so there used to be a lake sometimes so when the jhelum river is coming the surface of lake which is a plain so its energy is lost because going through plain is very difficult for a river because a river in its same stage is used to is accumulate a climate to go through what to steep slopes the river is going through steep slope then it has energy because of gravity but when a lake has to go to plain surface in very early stage of its life then it loses all of its energy so due to jhelum property of being flowing through a plain surface that used to be lakes in some days so it is it make meanders okay i hope you have understood this so far and you are with me now i'll tell you one thing more in our mythology it is said that there used to be a lake there used to be a rishi known as kashyap rishi on whose name kashmir is made okay kashyap rishi he drank all the water from that lake it is mentioned so what geographers have deduced like they have deduced that drinking of water was some we can say a symbol or a way of saying that the lake got dried up with time okay it is like a way of saying because we have seen it is this lake this lake is more this no lake is evidence of ancient lake so we have not named it because it does not exist okay of which uh, the lake of which uh, this the river, river is part of rivers are not parts of lakes rivers flow uh, start from glaciers and they flow on a mountain okay when a river is coming from top of mountain to plain surface okay it is very energetic because it has on its way found no plain no, surface no, i'm asking sir why why did he refer to specific kashyap marsh kashyap story because it is a proof in mythology that some days it's at some point of time there used to be a lake we just a proof of lake uh, now there is no lake but the surface of the lake that is plain a plain surface in mountains where there is steep slopes only so that river used to merge with the lake sometimes but now there is no lake so river is goes through it lake. and just passes it and loses energy thus forming meanders at very early stage okay is that clear i am why i am focusing too much on this concept because i am just prioritizing the concepts which i have been asked in upsc or is there very strong possibility of being asked because these concepts are important in from perspective of upsc only okay <coughs> okay <coughs> i'll tell you one more fact about that lake that lake that you are talking about it was a large lake and the the lake that you talked about earlier a freshwater lake it is a small part of that lake only okay 
that lake has shrunk down so much that there is a small lake which we call Dal Lake. Dal Lake used to be a large lake with some other name at some point of time through which through surface of which Jhelum flows today. Okay. Is there a link between Dal Lake and Bulu Lake? I don't think so. As of now, these are two separate lakes. There is similarity between Dal Lake and Bulu Lake. They both are in JNK and they both are freshwater lakes. Other than that, there are no similarities whatsoever. Okay. So we talk about Mika. Mika. We are not talking about a celebrity singer Mika Singh. We are talking about a mineral known as Mika. Okay. What is Mika? Why is it used? <coughs> High crystal. Hmm. It has very strong insulating properties. When we cover science, we'll uh, explain it in details. But what is insulation? There's two concepts in science. When we talk about flow of electricity or flow of heat energy, conduction and insulation. What is conduction? When a body is able to pass uh, pass the current through itself, through its its structural without losing structural integrity, just allowing the current to pass through itself. It is known as conduction. Like we say water, salt water is a good conductor of electricity. We say metals, copper, silver. Silver is the best conductor of electricity. Okay, so insulator is opposite. The type of material which does not let current to pass through it. When talking about current, then it is electrical insulator. When talking about heat, then it is heat insulator or heat conductor. Okay, so mica has very strong insulating properties that it does not let current pass through itself. These properties of mica are very important in many industries and India is one of the largest exporter of Mika India okay one of largest still we prefer seeing one of why because it keeps on changing because the amount of Mika that you are going to find beneath the surface is not same sometimes the country A finds it more sometimes India finds it more so the key places can keep on changing so we prefer seeing one of the largest okay <coughs> India has a near monopoly. We can say approximately 60% of worldwide production of mica is done in India. There is a difference between production and export. Please give due focus on this concept because many students I have seen over my teaching career that many students get confused in production and export. See, whatever is being produced in the territory of India, most of it if not all of it, most of it gets consumed in the territory of India itself. Okay, some of the stuff even gets consumed so much that its demand is still not met, and we may need to even import it. So India can be importer of something as well as the largest producer at the same time, because India is also one of the largest consumers on to its large population. Okay, so production is something relating to creation of goods, and export is something related to the stuff that is left behind that is either not useful for India for example Mika why is Mika exported so much because in India there is very weak manufacturing sector it, its application is mostly where the manufacturing sector in factories India is poor India has developed the skip through the manufacturing part and we are now becoming a service based economy so that is why the application of Mika is mostly in the countries where the manufacturing sector is strong so India prefers to export it instead of using it on its own because it just can't. Is that clear? I hope so. So this is a Koderma plateau in Andhra Pradesh. What is a plateau? I'll tell you in brief. In okay, this is a hill. These are mountains. Okay, hills are 600 meters tall. This is just the rough uh, demarcation. The six up to six five six hundred meter tall mountains we call them hills. Or the large mountain more than that one thousand meters up to eight 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 that is Mount Everest. So eight four eight I think. So the all that category of mountains are known as mountains only. Okay, the small mountains are called hills. Similarly, the mountains which are like this, which do not have a peak, which are like just this shape. We can call them mountains, or we can prefer calling them plateaus. Plateau is a specific term for these kind of structures, okay, which are instead of in cone shape, they, which are instead like this, okay, with a plane surface type of plane surface on top. This is known as plateau, okay. So there is a Kuderma plateau where in Andhra Pradesh, Co, 
Kodarma. This Kodarma plateau is home to production of Mika. So, what do you know about Mika? Mika is produced in Andhra Pradesh, mostly in the Kodarma plateau. India is the large one large just exporters of Mika. Okay, production producers as well. Mika is famous for its insulating properties. It is widely used in the manufacturing sector in different different industries. I think that's enough. Just need to revise it. Okay. At this point of time, what I suggest you do is just listen patiently, because ninety percent of work is done already in your brain when you listen to stuff carefully. Your brain has a very unique properties. Every human brain has very unique properties of uh, listening to stuff, retaining it, and making connections. Okay, try to make as many connections with your prior memories, with your prior learning experiences. Link as much as possible. Try to link stuff like you know about iron. You try to do what. You know, mind like there are iron ores, there are iron mines. Similarly, if he's talking about some mineral, there must be mines, there must be ores of that as well. So try to open up your mind as much as possible. Try to connect things with each other because everything is connected, and at last everything we are studying about what we are studying about Earth and India only. So everything will connect and come to same conclusions. Doesn't matter from which path we go. Okay, everything is connected with each other. Each subject. Bit economy, polity, geography, everything is connected to each other. Is nickel an ore or direct mineral? Like okay. bauxite, aluminium. See, we humans have found applications of every each and every mineral in its own way. But nature, nature doesn't know the difference as we know. Okay, in na nature, everything is found in impure form. For what? For <coughs> What we call impurity is something that is not useful to us. But for nature, it doesn't discriminate between different minerals or anything. So everything is found in form of ores only. Everything is purified. The process of purification we say purify, but we are just separating the useful stuff which we find useful from the random stuff. But for nature, everything is same. So we find ores of every mineral. From those ores, we extract the useful stuff. We call that process purification. Or extraction of the mineral. Okay, so in nature everything is found in form of ores only. What are ores? O R E S ores. My question was that you know, is nickel uh -huh. an ore or um, uh, like uh, a metal or something like aluminium? There are some ores which has specific names like iron ore is called hematite or magnetite something like that, and bauxite or is the uh, is the where uh, aluminium is found. Similarly, so nickel has no mother ore like that. Mica ore is not a mica only, okay? Because from that ore, mica is the only substance that is useful that is extracted. So the ore's name is based on the mineral that we find useful, okay? Sometimes in an ore, the mineral that we are looking for is in huge quantities. In that case, as well, we name the ore the same, okay? And sometimes there is copper or there are other metals that are formed intermixing, and we need to extract from one of the metals. Then we can give the ore different names according to uh, the amount of matter that is presented in that ore. Okay, and this is the at max we need to go into this topic for our UPSC purposes. We just continue. We talk about Sundarbans. Okay, I'll give you a second to think about it if you have already know anything about that. What are Sundarbans? Sundarbans are mangroves. What are mangroves? Or mangroves? Some people say mangroves. Some people prefer saying mangroves. Oh, it was a special features kind of mm -hmm. stuff that made them sort the problems. Yes. That uh, I request people watching on YouTube, please comment if you know about it. We'll try to reply as much as possible. Okay. So <coughs> mangroves. These are special. Specialized trees. We have seen trees. Okay, we all have seen forests. We have seen trees around us. What is specialty of a tree? Whenever we grow a seed, when we put a seed in soil, so it needs air, it needs water. But have you ever heard the concept of water logging? Have you ever heard it? Okay, I tell you. When there is excess water. Most of the plants and trees are not able to survive. 
बिकॉज वाई दे नीड वाटर बट दे नीड वाटर इन स्पेसिफिक क्वान्टिटीज इफ द क्वान्टिटीज इज मोर देन द प्लांट और द ट्री लूज इज इट्स लाइफ बट बट ऑन वेटलैंड वट आर वेटलैंड वेटलैंड आर द प्लेस इज दैट कंटेन मिक्स ऑफ वाटर एंड सॉइल वे वाटर पार्ट इज मोर देन द सॉइल पार्ट ओके दैट इज वाई दे कॉल वेटलैंड ओके दल दल एरिया दैट वी डिस्कस एल यू सो वट इज स्पेशलिटी अबाउट द वेटलैंड दैट देर आर सम टाइप ऑफ ट्रीज which have what which have made themselves adaptable to those climatic conditions these are trees specifically mangroves are trees which have learned over time to live or to thrive on the places on the wetlands so sundarbans are large wetlands located in west bengal and bangladesh okay west bengal in india bangladesh in bangladesh okay these are specialized trees which have adapted to survive on wetlands sundarbans are wetlands similarly just like trees have learned to survive similarly there is a species of tigers the mighty bengal tiger bengal tiger you all must have heard about it is really famous bengal tiger is scheduled two of the wpa 1972 which will go in details in other chapters it is a protected species of tiger which is specifically found in india only that is why it is named bengal tiger when they used to be britishers these bengal tigers used to inhabit large parts of india which even we cannot imagine today having seen or uh, have to, uh, like we can find possibly a tiger in there today but and after before 150 or 200 years bengal tigers used to live on almost all of the forest which were possible okay so the britishers at that time were not aware and similar the local rajas maharajas they used to hunt them for their pleasure they were at that time not familiar with the ecosystem ecology or why do we need to protect the species they just for sake of their own bravery it was a custom to hunt animals and bengal tiger was uh, considered as the most prized possession even at that time as well okay there is a famous photograph in one of the ncert books where a british officer is standing and he has alone killed as much as 15 to 20 tigers bengal tigers and he is proudly clicking or getting clicked a photograph of his uh, work okay so he is proud of killing these tigers but now what is happening this population is diminishing and diminishing population bengal tiger being an umbrella species of keystone species a very important species signifying the ecosystem the health ecosystem of area is getting extinct okay this all the terms which you may not be familiar today we will discuss it in subsequent lectures you just try to understand as much as you are uh, understanding easily i am telling you more than required just because even if you remember 20% or 30% that will be more than sufficient for you to crack your exam okay if i tell you 100% you will try to at least learn from me and you some one will get 25% some one will get 40% and even i am saying 20% is more than enough so just patiently listen to me no need to uh, make any notes or no need to for burden yourself okay just uh, consider it as a movie why i am going so fast some of you may find the speed fast because i want to cover all of the chapters all of the subjects in very limited time possibly before 20 years of may if possible i'll try my best all right so we have uh, we have talked about bengal tiger just like mangroves bengal tigers have also learned to live here in this area these are three species of mangroves known as sundari tree which tree sundari sundari tree from name this sundari tree the name has given to sundar bans 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 ban forest the forest that contains sundar sundar is sundari trees okay the sundari tree forest are called sundar bans which contains bengal tigers which have mangroves mangroves are specialized seeds uh, trees whose seeds are as nematophores nematophores the scientific term for the type of seeds that mangroves give for the mangroves ha uh, have okay i'll explain what they are in a second the 
there is a quality of uh, there is one special quality of a series of mangroves. Why I'm telling you this? Because I have already talked about the importance of wetlands, the importance of mangroves. So UPSC is very much obsessed with all these topics. So they tend to go deep in some specific topics which they find important and just uh, touch surface of other topics which they are not very relevant to the the kind of stuff happening around uh, in general in an environment field like agriculture and all those things. Okay, so this is one of the topics which UPSC likes to go deep into. That is why we talk about seeds of mangroves. Don't take it as sir is going teaching us about seeds. He teach about us about banana seeds. He teach us about every seed of every tree. No, I'm very very like scrutinizing the topics in a very you can say accurate way. I'm trying to predict what UPSC has been asking over the years and what the UPSC may ask in future. Okay, so with that being said, we talk about seeds. Seeds. Of mangroves, they are not nematophores. Okay, you may verify the spellings. Nematophores are type of seeds which are able to breathe through water. Okay, it is water. This is a mangrove. The roots of mangroves are also like this. They take oxygen from here because most of the surface is always in water. So they have learned to live in this way. They have evolved. They have adapted. They have evolved their organs in a way that are able to make them survive. So the seeds are just floating here. Okay, a seed floats in the water. Whenever a seed finds a dry surface, whenever a seed encounters a dry sand or anywhere, it gets stuck and it grows there. Okay, before growing there, the seed just grows on the plant itself. This is a very unique seed. The seed will grow on plant itself. A small plant will come to the seed, and when the situation is right, it will float the plant. The seed containing the plant will float on the surface of water unless and until it finds a dry surface. After finding a dry surface, the seed settles itself and it starts making roots inside the land, and the plant over the surface grows into a full fledged. Mangrove over the period of time, it may take 10 to 15 years or 20 years for a full-size mangrove, but the process goes in this cycle only. Okay, so every mangrove is very very far away from its parent mangrove, but in other in case of other plants, as we know, the seeds drop from the surface. Okay, there is also a idiom in English that apple doesn't fall away from its tree. Okay, but in this case, these seeds fo fall. Very far away from its tree. I'm, I hope you're getting your long journey uh, until now. Just like the previous lecture, I want you to be patient. This will be a phase of learning. You will learn a lot, you will learn a lot of new things as well. Just be patient and calm down and lie on your back and just focus on my voice if you not want to. See the blackboard because I write what I speak as I am writing as well. Okay, so you don't need to worry about it. So <clears throat> I'll tell you a little bit about plateaus. We have already talked about Cordelino plateau. I'll write down some names. Okay, of plateaus. Malga plateau. These are important. Chota Nagpur. Okay, CNP. Some people say CNP. Okay. Kirby Anglong, Kirby Anglong, Bastar, Bastar, okay. These plateaus have something in common. They all are part of a larger plateau, we plateau group of plateau called Deccan Plateau. This area we call Peninsular India. Peninsular India. What is a peninsula? If a water, if a piece of land is enclosed by water from all its four sides it is known as island examples of islands for example madagascar madagascar is what it is an island but what is a peninsula peninsula is a piece of land which is surrounded by water from its three sides one side being connected left connected to the land okay when a piece of land is uh, enclosed or surrounded by water from three sides it is known as Peninsula. So this region of India is called Peninsular India. Peninsular India because here is 
Arabian Sea, in this side it is Bay of Bengal, on the southern side it is Indian Ocean. So on the peninsular India there are some very important tattoos. Okay. In India you will find tattoos in this area only. But you will find hills and mountains on this whole area, Himalayas. Okay, this area is filled with a lot of hills and mountains, while this area is filled with plateaus. This all uh, we think we will study physical geography. How hills are formed, what is plate tectonics, all the stuff we are still we will discuss. But as of now, because we are doing Indian geography, we will just see where they are located. Marga Plateau, Madhya Pradesh, somewhere here, CLP, or Chota Nanku Plateau, Jharkhand, okay, Kirby Angulam, Assam, Assam, somewhere in Assam, all right. While talking about Nanku Plateau, I will also mention some important things. There is a mountain range, Aravis. Okay, like this. I'll tell you a very interesting thing about Aravalis. Alright. There are mountains here, no, Aravalis and the mountains here. No more different names. This whole long big mountain range is called Himalayas. You must all have heard about it. Uh, Himalayas very much like very common. Uh, mentioned uh, a lot. So what is the difference between Himalayas and Aravali range? So the Himalayas are formed, they are young mountains, they are young block mountains. They are formed very late, they are very young. In the world talk about time span in terms of geology, we will talk in details in the subsequent lectures, but they are young mountains and Aravalis are comparatively very very old mountains. So being old mountains, they are part of the peninsular area or the, uh, the Deccan Plateau. But Himalayas are not part of the Deccan Plateau. These, these the mountain ranges here and here, they are two, they originate from two totally different geological time spans or geological events. So they have no geological connection. Are you with me so long so far? We continue. So I don't know whether you know about it or not. This is a concept of monsoon. Okay, monsoon. Monsoon are the winds that carry water from the Arabian Sea and later on from Bay of Bengal that is responsible for bringing rainfall to the territory of our beloved India. So monsoon are the winds that we should be thankful for our economy to be flourishing. All right. So these monsoon winds come through here. There are western ghats and it rains a lot here. But while returning, while doing its job, these monsoon winds just flows like this. Okay, there is a huge difference like this on Western Ghats as well as on these Himalayas. These monsoon winds are like in this direction. I just let me raise the board quickly. I hope this area is visible to you. See, okay, like this. But in case of Aravalis, monsoon winds are like this. This is the known as parallel. Parallel. But this is known as intersection or just colliding. You can say. So monsoon winds are colliding. Whenever monsoon winds carrying a lot of water collides with the mountain, it rains. It rains a lot. Okay. So it has made this area one the place with highest mountain rainfall in all over the world. It, there is a place called Mosin Ram. Mo Sin Ram. Mosin Ram has the highest quantity of rainfall anywhere in the world because monsoon winds are trapped here and they just empties the winds empties themselves here in Mosin Ram. Whereas even having a big good uh, size of mountain range, Rajasthan is famous for its being dry. Rajasthan has no rain, near to no rainfall, very less rainfall. You must all have seen movies, the kind of deserts that there are in Rajasthan. So even having mountains, why is it so, why lacks rain? Because the winds are parallel to the mountain range. They are not like this, they are like this. So they are not able to, uh, they are not able to put water 
not able to shed its coat. They are about they are containing they are not able to uh, bring rainfall to the Rajasthan area. So they just skip it and go ahead and go to Gujarat or some other place. Okay. This is the reason why in the same country with mountain ranges everything in monsoon. Monsoon Ram is world's highest and Rajasthan one of the driest. And even located being located on the same what do you call latitude. Okay. These are longitudes. These are latitudes. I'm trying to uh, stop myself from going for the details on every topic because we are going to cover these topics in physical geography. I'm trying to contain myself or limit myself to Indian geography only because everything is connected as I have told you earlier. If I do not make this barrier of myself, we will find ourselves talking about something entirely different. Maybe AI or maybe something relating to very different in no matter of time. So I am trying to contain myself to the subject of matter that we have in our hands today. <coughs> okay. <coughs> I am not calling it a, it a crash course but this is what is in my mind. I am trying to make it as fast as possible so that everything is covered before 28th of May 2023. But this, these lectures will be equally useful for the students appearing in 2024, 2025 and in UPSC exams uh, till the syllabus is same. And UPSC is not very famous for changing the syllabus uh, so often, so we will be good. Next, we will talk about a little about Saddle Peak. What? Saddle Peak. So there are islands, okay. There is Lakshadweep Island and there are Andaman and Eco Islands, okay. I don't know whether this is visible to you or not, but I'll draw small India here. Why I'll draw small India instead of big India, so that you can clearly see the location of islands. It would be very, I would like appreciate it if you can open a uh, map of India in new tab where if you are watching it on a laptop device or if you have an atlas, uh, an atlas nearby, just grab it real quick and continue the lecture. Hit the pause button, grab an atlas, come back to this lecture. You will be able to better understand it. Okay, India is very, very calm slow, but we will try to make more. So, here is Lakshadip. Here we have Andaman, Nikol. Okay. Here is Sumatra. Here is Sri Lanka. So these islands are near to Sumatra. You know, Sumatra is in Indonesia. Even located, uh, even belonging to India, these islands are near to Sumatra instead of Sri Lanka or Tamil Nadu. This was the question that was once asked in UPSC. They asked the location of Andaman and Nikol islands is near to Sumatra, something like that was the question when people were not able to imagine the location because they have heard and read all their lives that these are uh, islands of India, islands of India. So very logically they thought they must, they must be near to Sri Lanka or not Sumatra. These type of mistakes occur when you have do not have a clear image of maps inside of your heads. So please refer to Atlas and see where India is, where Sumatra is, where Sri Lanka is, where the, these islands are. Okay. So, Saddle Peak is the highest peak in the North Andaman Island. North Andaman. Okay. Saddle Peak. It is something that is important, so please remember it. Saddle Peak. Okay. Saddle Peak is the highest peak in North Andaman Island. <coughs> there is also one island known as Barren. Barren. Barren literally means empty. But in our case, why we are discussing Barren Island? It has active volcanoes. Nowhere in India, territory of India, will find an active volcano except Barren Island. Barren Island in Andaman. Okay. This is the only speciality of this island that we are discussing. You know what used to happen in British rule? Britishers had made a very kind of strict or place where they used to torture people, where they used to put criminals, put danger criminals, oh, not actual danger criminals because saying someone criminal is a loaded fact because a person can be a revolutionary for one person or at the same time he may be a criminal for another person 
so the people who should used to think are criminals in their context those people were sent to andamans jail even today there is a cellular jail cellular jail cellular jail where in andamans central jail cellular jail these jails were known as kala pani it was like kind of a very threatening thing at that time people were saying ki don't raise your voice against the government or you will send to kala pani even today people refer it in some many contexts that usko to kala pani ki saza ho gayi hai you must have seen it in movies as well okay so kala pani was nothing but a jail in andamans okay now i want the next concept to be very clear to you so i'll try to explain it in a very uh, clearer manner so that you can relate it to it you all must have seen people belonging to negrito origin okay what we say blacks okay you know that blacks are now spread all over the world because in the early times in colonial times they were used as slaves so they were transported to european countries you can find a great population in europe in france in spain in england at same time you can find in africa is all about them but uh, apart from africa you can find them in many uh, countries of south america and most in us in many places so the people from that origin negrito okay this we can call them race they were race to race humans are known to some races races has lost its relevance in modern times because this division is uh, now considered out of date because they say that nothing uh, the iq level or the strength nothing is relating to the race it's just a culture or stuff we don't want to go into that details but from that concept what we try to understand the type of tribes what are tribes tribes or tribes adivasi log kon hote hain ji adivasi wo hote hain jo aam samaj mein nahi reh rahe jo shehar mein mainstream city mein nahi reh rahe hain who who not living with among us who are not practicing stuff like us and there are two types of tribes one are isolated tribes and one are tribes who have intermixed with other people so in india most of tribes on the mainland india most of tribes are mixed okay but in case of andaman and nicobar the tribes are isolated isolated tribes okay so there are very important tribes in great and uh, in andamans okay four tribes in andaman and two tribes in nicobar soja go to sleep soja okay it is a trick to remember the tribes in andamans okay center is these are the most one of the most uh, isolated tribes in the world we humans uh, the indian government has tried establishing contacts with them several times even if, when there was a flood on that area indian government uh, sent a helicopter to check on them to see whether they are fine or whether they need of some relief material and they just shot uh, what we say javelins or bhalas at the helicopters so they are so backward they don't understand the concept of modernity or anything and some of the people started worshiping and doing weird rituals and seeing strangers okay there was uh, before 5 years i think there was news of a christian preacher who was sent from america who had a mission he claimed that he will convert all of these tribes to christianity but he was killed and his body was found on the coast of andamans so this is so bad for us to imagine okay centralis next one is onge okay next one is jarawa okay a and b is andamanis okay centrally is onge jarawa these four are negrito tribes okay black origins and on the nicobar islands 
they are derived from ostroid region these are no not ostroid sorry mongoloid i'll tell you what mongoloid is nicobaris trompens the people belonging to china north east india korea japan mongolia many places in central asia or pakistan kazakhstan tajikistan what do these all people have in common they belong to a race that is called the mongoloids okay so what is it the other way around were inhabited uh, many many years ago possibly thousands of years ago by the migrants that came from africa on small boats okay, this is the theory but there are several other theories as well but this is the theory that they are related and nicobar are related very uh, situated very near to sumatra so people came from there to nicobar that is where they are mongoloid and people from africa they reached to andaman so that is their negative this is the difference so the six tribes tribes are very very important for upsc because these tribes need support suppose you are placed in demand as a deputy commissioner in future so you need to have a proper knowledge like what are the needs of that tribes what theory should you follow should you let them be remain in isolation or you should make them learn the you know in three cities of uh, modern life so it will be on you some day decide on the fate of these people who have been neglected or who have been neglected by we can say who chose to be neglected uh, so for so long period of time okay and it has always been debatable like whether these tribes should be joined to mainstream society would it be better for them because they are pros that they will get better medical facilities they will get many better education but the cons as well because so people say that they are self sufficient and they are able to sustain the communities for thousands of years so we don't need not to interfere in the life rate so this is where it is going on ever since we not go on too much details okay so we talked about andaman and nico islands okay so andaman and nico islands are separated by something called 10 degree channel okay we do not need not to go details but we we'll just grab it 10 degree channel it separates what andaman and nicobar islands all right <clears throat> there is a very 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 important bird bird species birds are also liked a lot by upsc last year a question was asked like pintail stork uh, there were three four names of birds then they asked what these names are of what uh, these names associate are associated which of the following fish birds the often like that so those were the names of birds so if you remember birds then you can relate to that like yes i have heard to a similar name that belong to a bird okay so birds are important for upsc questions are asked every year okay one two questions are asked so narcondum hornbill You can search on Google to see how a hornbill looks like. It is a small bird with a big beak. The beak is in shape like of shape to dig out insects from water or from land. So it has a big beak, it is small head. It is a very beautiful bird that needs some protection for our ecological sustenance. All right. So now, what is the hornbill? Endemic. It is endemic. What is endemic? when something is limited to a specific area while it has originated from that area or while it has been brought from outside but when it is limited 
to some area only then that thing that be it a plant be it an animal that thing is called endemic okay so narcondum hornbill as the name suggests is endemic to andaman islands there is a narconda or narcondum island in on andaman group of islands andaman is not an island itself andaman is a group of islands all right the small islands with different names okay it is an endangered species endangered this one level higher that is critically endangered and after that extinct okay there is near threatened so it is not vulnerable near threatened it is a very small thunder yes very small thunder mount thunder is also here yeah. i think the nicobar i think yes highest peak of nicobar yes yes mount thunder is highest peak of nicobar So this was it for the part two of this video. We'll continue with this video lectures and we'll uh, help you complete your geography or revise your concepts. Or sometimes what happens is there's a concept and we know about it, but we have not understood it on that level, on that depth that helps us to retain it in the examination room. So that way we are trying to brushing up our all of the syllabus. Thanks a lot for watching. I hope to see you all in the next video. Please do like, subscribe and share. Thank you.